Okay. Hey guys, welcome to the rollout. I am Lindsay Rousseau. And I'm Genevieve Marie. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Yay. Oh, we have three absolutely fantastic guests today. If you've seen the show before, you guys will remember Francesca Callow from our super fun episode where we played lots of games. And we have Diana Toshiko and then we have Brian Patterson. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so a lot has been said, talked about, you know, with regards to diversity in television shows, you know, with Bridgerton coming out, and then we had Shadow and Bone. And so there's been a lot of opinions and discourse going on surrounding some of the different shows and, you know, who's doing it right, who's doing it not so right, who's trying. And so we just wanted to, you know, kind of have a conversation about your all's thoughts on how Hollywood's doing. Are they doing better? You know, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, a couple of the shows that obviously have been talked about, like we mentioned earlier, have been specifically Bridgerton with, you know, the blind casting, Shadow and Bone with taking what was a white protagonist in the books and making her half Asian in the show. Uh, and then, you know, you have lots of other episodes, you know, shows like Legends of Tomorrow and Batwoman really talking about LGBTQ issues um, and, you know, systemic police racism. And and profiling. So um, let's just dive in um, and see what you guys, what your thoughts are. Yes, but please let's first introduce oh. yourselves. Yes. Um, oh my gosh. Yes. Let's do that first. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> you all have uh, amazing, you know, credits in the entertainment yes. industry. And so we'd love to hear, you know, some of the stuff you guys been up to. Francesca, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, so I'm Francesca Callow. I am an actor and voice actor currently based in New York, but I work by coastally. Um, some shows that I've worked on are Pokemon, video games like Warframe, Wasteland 3, uh, film like Ocean's 8 and Mare of Easttown. Just getting my foot in everything. So it's nice to meet you all and see you all again. Yay. Diana. Hey, uh, I am Diana Toshko. I am an actress in LA and i uh, I also do photography. I just did the uh, 2020 ABC showcase, which was amazing and awesome. Um, talk about representation. And then this year I did um, Good Trouble. I did a guest star on Dave, which is coming out and uh, some mocap work. Um, and yeah, and I have a kid. <laughs> <laughs> a very adorable kid. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and Brian. Uh, hi, my name is Brian. I'm a performer. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time. Um, I've been in over 120 commercials and industrials. I was a series regular on a TV show on the Reverie Network. I was under contract with San Francisco Opera for about seven years. And uh, I'm currently uh, producing some works while I just moved to LA right before the, um, the pandemic and the lockdown. And now I'm starting to... Uh, get my footing down here and figure out what Hollywood's all about. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> We're glad to have you, even though the first year was a rough start. <laughs> yeah, to right. say the least. To say the least. All um, right. So yeah. um, Shadow and let's start with Shadow and Bone. I, my interests are actually um, probably going to be ping-ponging because I just recently watched the two of them uh, back to back is the differences between Shadow and Bone and Bridgerton and the casting choices that they made in both because for me personally uh, coming from a theater background Bridgerton kind of did blind casting and they kind of didn't um for me blind casting is more like um Brandy's Cinderella and where you will have people that are in the same family and they are related however they are not um of the same race like the like the king and the queen are of two different races but their son is a completely different race than uh, either the king or the queen um and so and that shows in in Brandy uh in Brandy in uh, Brandy's Cinderella but in Bridgerton you have the families and if it's uh, you know a white you know two white parents their entire like brood which 
there is like you know like three daughters in certain families like the Bridgerton family has like seven I don't even know how many there's a lot like, there's a lot <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of children and they're all and it's uh two white parents and um then all of the children will subsequently be white um with the duke's family it's uh two black parents and so then you know the duke is obviously black and the you know he and i'm I'm assuming their baby is you know going to be you know half black half white um spoilers by the way (laughs) but (laughs) um but it's not like it's it's definitely one of those things it's not traditional um it's not traditional blind casting and I was wondering if you guys had any thoughts about that does that bother you does that not bother you is it something that is you know is the hybrid a bit more like maybe accept more maybe acceptable or pleasing to a wider audience I'm not sure it really didn't bother me I just noticed because I have an eye for more like a more theatrical castings of things. Genevieve, I know what you mean because uh, I also have been doing theater for a few decades and it yeah. it's it's weird when I see something I'm like, oh, well, that's what they would do in theater. <laughs> and then yeah. you see it on TV and you're like, hmm, oh, okay, I see what you're doing here. Um, I personally haven't had a chance to see it so I don't have much an opinion on it, but it usually doesn't bother me. Like when I saw, because everything goes back to Wonder Woman for me, when I saw (laughs) Wonder Woman 1984 um, (laughs) and I saw that uh, uh, Maxwell Lord's son was of a different race, it just didn't bother me. I didn't think anything of it. Um, Right. It usually just doesn't bother me. Yeah. Because that's the world we live in, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Francesca? Yeah, Sorry. Uh, I think what I liked about Bridgerton, though, because I did see it, is that the world itself, as Brian was kind of like alluding to, is also diverse in its own way. Like there are extras that are of all different kinds of races or ethnicities. There's the queen who's a black actress. There's it's all like just part of the world and they're not like trying to make a statement about it. It's just what it is. And for I think like a period piece, for what is essentially a period piece, I think that's kind of what I think that's kind of new. I think Hollywood itself, you were asking about like how Hollywood is. I think Hollywood is trying to figure out where they are on the scale of things. They're trying to, at one point, it was too much one way. Now they're trying to balance it out with more diversity and they're trying to figure out the best way to do it while keeping their audiences entertained and what's going to make them money, unfortunately. But I actually thought Bridgerton was a great kind of jumping point in terms of talking about the diversity and what it should be in terms of representation for the industry, because the world itself is so diverse anyway, and we're all made up of different people. And so these stories should have just a world of diversity within it and just have it, let it be. Um, and I haven't seen Brandy Cinder in a really long time, but <laughs> it's, <laughs> but it's so good. It it's still holds up, I will tell yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's what I was thinking. So, but I think it's kind of a step in the right direction. Obviously, there's still so much more that we as an industry need to do in terms of casting in general. But right. I thought Bridgerton, because you see period pieces that are either all white or if they're trying to be like edgy, they'll like pick another race and just stick with that race. And that's all everyone. <laughs> oh, will that's be. true too. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think having the mix at least Mm -hmm. was a step forward for Hollywood and people. Yeah. I felt like it was like a baby step forward because they did keep it within the same family as like you were saying, Mm -hmm. right, Genevieve. Um, And they were trying to base it somewhat on uh, history because Queen Charlotte, you know, was possibly uh, half black or black from my understanding. So that's why they casted it that way. But it's totally different with Shadow and Bone. Shadow oh, and Bone is fantasy, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, let's and, dive but, into that. Yeah, let's let's dive into that, Diana. Yeah, what are your thoughts? Well, I think with Shadow and Bone, what they did with the main character when they changed her into half shoe, which is their like Chinese version, right? Or Mang- <laughs> Mongolian. Um, I think they it was a very bold choice. And it's different from Bridgerton in, in the fact that they tried to use it as sort of like a like a talking point and they had characters comment it on it a lot 
and were racist towards her a lot where I didn't really see that on Bridgerton. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so I overall enjoyed it. I just, uh, I wanted there to be a payoff as to why she was half shoe. Like I, there wasn't any comeback for her to be like, no, you're wrong about me or let me educate about this because she also was not educated about her history. So, you know, she didn't know what to say, but I hope there's a payoff later down the right. line. Season two. But yeah. what's interesting about Shadow and Bone is that obviously she, she, it wasn't like that in the books, but that also right. that, that allusion to racism was also not in there, which yeah. I have kind of like mixed feelings about in some ways because I'm like, did you just want to try and make a point during this time? Or <laughs> what were you trying to do with like, why was that necessary to the plot? Unless where's the payoff? Plot? Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's like, right. Why? You mention it and, and yet have, it goes like, nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the nations, I guess, are warring and they've had like a bad history with it, but it was very specifically like, yeah. these are very racist comments. There's like propaganda, like, posters yeah. that they have the oh my background. god right the and single propaganda like, poster that yeah. they don't make any like different right. types it's the same one well and yet we don't ever get to see any other shoe except for the one you know the trainer the guy yeah. who's the trainer whose name i'm oh, like there's, there's background asian people too right and then, the, it's and like, then there's well, this <laughs> were you being racist to them too because we never see any of that and then and we didn't see the, any go ahead sorry. I, I, I want to talk about it. Yo, go, go. Oh my God. <laughs> and we didn't see any real racism towards like a cast, uh, Jasper yeah, who was yeah. black. Or, and then like, we sort of saw a little bit of racism towards, you know, uh, uh, oh my God. What is her name? Inez. Thank you. Uh, for Because they were like, she's Suli. Yeah, right. Which is their sort of character. South Asian thing. Oh my God. Controversy with her, right? With the stunt double. Wait, what controversy? What? what? You no, know? oh no. I, I did not dig into Please any tell. of this. <laughs> well, I only know this because I read a lot of gossip magazines. It's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> but there was so controversy. So uh, her stunt double, Nej's stunt double, was not South Asian. Now, granted, they shot in okay. what Bulgaria or something, or no, mm. somewhere else. God, I'm, I'm like terrible. That. But it was a it was a white girl with blue eyes and blonde hair and they put a wig on her which is common when you're stunt doubling right yeah because they've yeah. even put men in women's right, position exactly. they versa. do that all the time right yeah but um it's controversial because they put this brown paint on her so it was oh. sort of yes and then she posted pictures of it yeah. oh and no one thought no one thought it was wrong and this was horrible oh. because they had an asian director they had a half asian woman who was a writer on Shadow and Bone, a half Asian lead, and none of them thought anything wrong about this person in brown face or yellow face, you know what I mean? And I was like, what the hell? So once that was posted, people were like, mm-mm. Mm-hmm. The same yeah. thing actually happened on no, Star Girl. Yeah, the same thing happened on Star Girl. Um, Angelica Washington, who plays, um, oh, totally blanking, Beth. Uh, sh- I was in a, um, a SAG stunt woman um, Zoom meeting maybe like a year ago, and she was saying her stunt double was white, and she raised the issue from day one. And they're like, we can't find any black people in Canada who are stunt women, apparently was the argument. Um, and I mean, kudos to her for raising the issue and bringing it up. But it's like, that's a really good point. It's like, we're not just talking about the faces of the people we're seeing, you know, we're also talking about the stunt doubles and stuff. It's like, did you try? Could you have flown someone talking, up from LA? You're also, you're also talking about the studio heads and the producers and the writers and the yeah. directors you're talking about the top people who make these decisions because right. you know a stunt person or an actor will just come in and be like am i right for the part thank you so much right. but they're the ones who make all these decisions so the problem is and like in the voiceover industry too there's a huge thing going around about it as well and casting and all that yes. but the problem comes from the top like right. in some ways the actors are at the bottom of the totem pole <laughs> in yeah. terms of making those decisions they don't have that much power in regards to right. that so it, it that's where I think Hollywood and the entertainment industry as a whole kind of fails you know they want to make these changes but they want to do the base bottom line of that they don't <laughs> want to see where it comes from which is the right. people with the money and all those decisions that's crazy though <laughs> that's like, but if you want to go out of your way excuse 
it, there's no excuse. If you want to go yeah. out of way and say, we're changing the lead character to be half Asian and we want representation. Yeah. And yet behind the camera, that doesn't matter as much. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, I'm like, yeah. yeah. But yeah, they, they released a statement and they're gonna, they said they're gonna do better. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> the, <laughs> the blanket, we're going to do better statement. I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I did not hear about that at all. I Neither usually- did I. I usually yeah. I just binge the show and move on. <laughs> but. Oh my god! Well, that's that's the difference between you and me, girl. Because I will literally, if they if I see like an Asian person, I will, I will immediately go on IMDb and see if there was a director who was Asian, if there was right if someone in the writer room who was Asian, because I just want to know if there's another voice behind there who knows what they're talking about. Right. Yeah. Right. Like Kim's convenience, like everything that went on with Kim's convenience. Right. Oh, all, that was and horrible. All those writers it. was yeah. That whole situation was just a trash fire, just right? continuing to like burn very brightly. But that was just bad. Yeah, they need. Yeah. I think Hollywood definitely needs to like rethink their diversity approach <laughs> and just include people. At right. least fifty percent of people should be a people a color or people of the global majority, in my opinion. Yeah. So that you can well, have and people. then you you've had people having the conversation um, with some shows that have come out recently, saying that some people are capitalizing on racial tragedy. You know, some oh. of the the Netflix shows that have come out where they're like, okay, it's it's another black story about racism and abuse. You know, well, is this appropriate? Are we just you know telling? Is this the only type of story we're seeing about this? And someone, you know, one of the reviews Genevieve and I watched about Shadow and Bone said the same thing. It was like, you gave us this, you know, this Asian lead, and yet she's just suffering racism and pain over and over again. And you know, and I'm totally blanking on the names of the shows, but two of those, you know, Netflix shows that came out, and people were just like, oh my god, this is so much violence and abuse. And can we only talk about tragedy? I mean. Right. Or like it's that like, movie, yeah, Karen. Oh, Bullwinkle, a slavery oh my story. God. Not again. Oh my god. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's like you yeah. obviously have stories, in me, but yeah, Brian, what what are your what are your thoughts about? Um, I I think that just like for um, hmm, go. What are my thoughts? I have so many. I don't know where to start. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> There's not enough time. There's not enough time. What do I do? <laughs> can I can yeah. I use a lifeline? No. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, it's really interesting how, and, I, and I'm going to use the LGBTQIA plus community for a minute. It's really interesting how they're like, let's make a gay movie. And I'm like, <laughs> there have been gay movies for decades now. It's just you're getting them. Hollywood's <laughs> discovering them. And it's because Hollywood is kind of this bubble. And as we all know, um, statistically, uh, about 70% of roles that are just written in Hollywood are, are for Caucasians. So you, ha you have that bubble going on and then they discover something and it's like, oh my God, I've discovered, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. And, um, <laughs> But there are, you know, uh, eating outs, one, two, three, four, and, you know, and 18 probably now um, that have the eating out movies have been going on for like 20 years now, which is a series of gay films. It's like a franchise. Um, but now that they're going mainstream, it's like they want to tell all of these coming out stories. And it's like, dude, we came out like 50 years ago. <laughs> We're done with that. Why don't you just tell stories just about gay people being gay people, like going, you know, having a breakdown, a nervous breakdown or, or you know, losing their job or, you know, normal stuff. I don't wanna hear another freaking coming out story. Enough already, we're done. Let's, let's not re-traumatize ourselves and let's move on. It's kind of the same thing with slavery. Can we stop telling slavery stories? We've done that trauma enough. Let's just tell stories about, oh, black people, I don't know, losing their jobs or having a mental breakdown, the same things that everyone else does. But what's interesting is from that perspective, you're gonna find uh, microaggressions, you're gonna find you know, um, economic disparity, you're gonna, you're gonna find reasons why these things happen instead of retelling just the story of slavery. And I think the reason why we don't hear these normal stories with just a little bit of nuance or culture or whatever is because well they just don't know 
Mm. Which is going back to uh, D- Diana, what you were saying earlier is, well, who's the below yeah, the people line? in the room? Well, who are the writers? Who are the directors? Yeah. You know, I mean, and there's been a couple of shows that I feel like have have kind of seemed to do that. Like Batwoman has been dealing with, you know, racial profiling and such, you know, but they have their every day to day lives. And, you know, the fact that they're lesbians is irrelevant and legends of tomorrow. It's like, Oh, we've got bisexual characters, but nobody talks about it. Cause it's just, this is who we are. Um, Can I just say, I almost cried when I watched Kung Fu because I, I, I as cheesy as it is, it, it was so like, exciting for me to see wow there are asians being just as cheesy as white people this is amazing (laughs) it was so awesome but then you also got some culture you also got a taste of their culture you also got uh different types you got some you know geeky people you got some people who were really smart you got some people who just were really superficial it was awesome to see that spectrum of asian people in television and i was so excited when i started watching it it's because i like cheesy television too, but. <laughs> but at the same time i don't know like why do all the stories have to revolve around one like why can't any story just have multiple people in it why does it yeah why does there need to be a conflict or of interest or anything like that and probably because hollywood is like well how can we make it dramatic and be like a Pot, like a story about Asians or Black people or whoever, Spanish, et cetera. Like, but casting, like, why can't we just, if you get like a side that's for the best friend next door, why can't that best friend next door be anything? Yeah. Why do we automatically assume certain things? It's so well, funny because uh, I very much look up to Shonda Rhimes. I think she's really amazing when it comes to making television for everyone. And it always baffles me how everyone is like, oh my God, how does she do it? Like, (laughs) she's so amazing. And I'm like, she just makes it like real life. How about that? (laughs) It's like so easy. Yeah. Well, I mean, the same thing could be said, Francesca, to your point about like, why can't the best friend be any race? I mean, we could say the same thing about gender. It's like the default is male. Like, yep. why does the delivery man have to be a man? Why does the cop have to be a man? And it's like, you know, when you see the breakdowns come out, it's, I don't know what the split is. I would argue 70, 30, I could be totally off, but I mean, it's still, even though women are 55% of the population, we're still not nearly that on television. And then we throw the age factor into it. And it's like, well, a woman over 50, it's like, we got hacks. (laughs) <laughs> and other stuff I don't know or she you know she, she there's you know a 60 year old guy and a 20 year old wife or something you know it's like those things even with the me too movement you know I know when USC came out with their statistics you know for both gender and race they're like nothing's changed despite yeah. all of this uproar totally it's it's amazing how everyone's it's everyone's talking about it. It's all the rage. At least that's what people are saying. But statistically, not much has changed at all. No, not at all. And that's, I was so happy to see representation on Shadow and Bone. But yeah, I still see like the report that comes out year after year that like a very small percentage of Asian people are seen. Even on a Shonda show. Yeah. We're in a mm-hmm. hospital. You should see tons of Asian nurses and tons of Asian doctors. <laughs> Where are they? <laughs> oh my God, that's so true. <laughs> even Spanish and Middle Eastern people, they also, it's so hard. Like yeah. there's been a talk in the voiceover world of like mm-hmm. the amount of people that get the lead roles are mostly Caucasian or get those auditions. And like Middle Eastern right. Spanish people, rarely even see that or they're pigeonholed in certain ways like oh, Frances, can I ask you something yeah I'm not familiar I like recently uh read an article about um how a lot of the voices uh for different ethnic characters are played by white people and that we just recently people are been going well maybe you should make an effort to find authenticity and then i went on the forum i forgot what forum it was and there was so, it was so racist people were like why i i'm an actor i'm a voiceover artist i can i can uh, do that yeah oh 
that gets me so mad. <laughs> the the reason of like well it should be it's voice acting so your voice shouldn't matter but the problem with that is that when they ask especially i find in voiceover when they ask for like an accent or something like that they're they're usually based on stereotypical sounds right like if you're like hey what does an asian sound like you can probably like think of a certain accent that people will be drawn to that they'll be like yes that's what an asian sounds like but they don't take into the fact that asia includes russia and includes Korea, and it includes Minor, Japan, <laughs> Japan, yeah, it includes everything. Um, and so there's like this, there is this huge thing of like, especially in the voiceover world of like, should everybody get a chance to audition for those kinds of roles? Yes. At the same time, should, if we go with what's authentic, are you then going to be pigeonholing those types of people into just doing those types of roles? And like, I think the issue is that people of color, people of the global majority don't get opportunities to begin with. And that's the main issue. They don't get to read for those roles that white people are reading for, even yeah. though they are of that background. So the fact that, I mean, yes, like ideally voices shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. But the fact that people aren't getting them, that's the issue it's not the casting and like like the simpsons um just fired uh what's his name not fired but he he stepped down hank azaria yeah and hank azaria yeah. stopped with a poo and then they yeah. um, also changed dr hibbert was the other one yeah. They, yeah to try and make it more authentic because why should these people especially if it's a story about culture or their mm -hmm. culture is related to the character so much how can they relate to those cultures and those characters if they've never experienced it? But yeah, there are people who are like, well, why should it matter? It's just voice acting. You don't see them. <laughs> and there However, are like, they are literally silencing voices. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> well, and you're seeing that debate within the LGBTQ plus community now is that is also the big thing in, in well, on camera, but also in voiceover as well is now, you know, we're seeing the breakdowns that are like, if you're auditioning for this role, you must be of this background. And now we're starting to see looking for LGBTQ plus people, looking for non-binary people. So we're starting to see it, you know, the race issue now expanding into the LGBTQ plus issues as well. And the exact same things are coming up. It's like, well, I'm an actor. I can do anything. And it's like, and to your point, Brian, it's like, well, you've never lived that life. So can you authentically portray it? Yeah. But the problem yeah, with that too, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you... No, no, so just quickly, like going off that real fast. The problem with that too is we're seeing breakdowns that are more specific that are like, you must be this, this, and this. But then you do run the risk of just pigeonholing those people in those types of, so casting in particular, but also all studios and everyone in the industry just needs to broaden. They need to find a balance of broadening their, their spectrum, but the, I think that comes from just allowing these people who have been silenced to just have the opportunities that every single white person gets. Mm. And hopefully then they'll be a step forward. Okay, Brian, sorry. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Check, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> um, well, oh, go ahead, Genevieve, yeah. I was gonna say that uh Francesca you you mentioned the one the name of the one thing that like when representation or when issues get into like now this is absolutely cringe and you you said it the movie the movie that came out Karen oh Karen oh yes. my god yeah, I, I want to see that, that. <laughs> I honestly did not think it was real until the until it went on for so long until the <laughs> trailer went on for so long that I was like oh, it is real <laughs> it, it is real I thought it was a parody or a joke I thought it was too it was an L2. wasn't <laughs> it wasn't it's real and so you have what I'm getting at is that you have a lot of Tyler Perry not like you have a lot of knockoffs now like you have you have a lot you have um i i mean sorry uh what is it 
what is the movie i'm i can't believe i said tyler perry get out jordan uh, peele jordan, that, jordan peele. peele's oh. get out i'm sorry i watched like two hours of this tyler perry movie like a podcast on tyler perry movie so it's in my head um but jordan peele's get out you have a lot of knockoffs like once get out um like hit the scene and it was so impactful and it just was like oh my god this is a great film then everybody it feels like has been trying to replicate the get out formula unsuccessfully (laughs) unsuccessfully yes thank you unsuccessfully (laughs) but they just as as we get further away from get out from the movie they just keep getting worse and i think it all culminates and ends with with karen (laughs) the fact that karen came out (laughs) and it's a thing i how do you who who knows about it like obviously brian you saw the trailer yeah mentioned it like let's talk about that let's talk about like false i would say like uh putting on airs like false trying to be false wokeness you it's know it's really interesting uh because i for me um i think the reason why diana was talking about getting you know those voices in the writers room or you know lindsay was pointing out how important it is to have representation when telling those stories or you know francesca was saying you know give these people an opportunity opportunity to audition for these parts is because of karen versus uh, Get Out. When you watch Get Out, there is a power that comes with that movie because of its authenticity. When I watched that movie, I there were things that I was like, <laughs> because I had experienced them. There were things that were being represented on screen because I knew ex- I it was resonating within every fiber of my being. But when you watch Karen and you see that, um it feels very inauthentic Mm -hmm. it feels very manufactured and it just doesn't resonate because quite frankly i don't and i don't know because i haven't seen it and i can't wait to see it um but i don't think that it seems very authentic probably just like like they have like a bullet point list that they're like all right we need these scenarios (laughs) just let's check them off the list the pitch was probably like, oh, Karen's like a big thing trending. Let's just make a horror movie off of it and see what happens. <laughs> Maybe we'll make money. <laughs> Someone's gonna um, There's a friend of mine who, uh, she just got hired to be a writer on a television show. Um, or, I'm sorry, she was about to be hired to be a writer on a television show. And she was between, it was between her and another woman. My friend is uh, Asian American and the other woman is white. And so my friend wrote a script that was based on her life story. It was based on things that her mother did and said. It was based on their relationship. It, like every single, she had put so much of her life into the script and she delivered it to the, the uh, I guess the pe- people who were running the writer's room, you know, the showrunner and uh, the head writer and yada, yada. And they said, this doesn't feel real. No mom would say that. And she, she was like, but my mom did say all of those things. And then the woman that she was in you know, competition with, who was white, submitted something. And they were like, yeah, that's what we want. And, and she said, no Asian person would say that. <laughs> so I think that um, there's a, and I don't even know how to like properly articulate this, but I think there's a lack of exposure to what is authentic and what isn't. Um, we, I, I think we have been so inundated with stereotypes that we think that's what's real, when in actuality, that's not what, what is real. I, I um, was thinking about uh, just personally, there's this thing called, uh, there's a stigma to Asian excellence. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, going along with Karen, it's like, do we go out of our way to support something even if it's bad, just because it has representation. Mm. Yeah. And so like with Asian excellence is like, we, we want to support everything, but it's, it, we don't want to be too hard on ourselves to be like, it has to be a hundred times better because then, you know, that that's a whole nother thing. But uh, do we support something that's 
terrible, even though you see a cast that's super diverse mm -hmm. because you want to show them that people will watch this stuff that's multicultural, mm -hmm. multi-ethnic. And so, you know, Hollywood will go, oh, we need to make more of this, even if it's, do you know what I mean? Like, where, um, where, do. Do, we, where do we stop watching? <laughs> well, the same thing is kind of the, the, the polar opposite has been a discussion within the Latinx community community. And they're like, we've got, you know, like one day at a time and we've got in the Heights and it's like these great, you know, diverse casts, but it's like, at the end of the day, most of the Latinx stories we're getting are like the low income struggling family, the single mom living in the ghetto. It's like, yes, those are authentic stories, but what about the upper middle class family in Brownsville, Texas, and the parents are dentists? It's like, you know, we're, it's like, yes, we want to support those shows. And that is a reality, but is that the only reality? I don't um, know what the answer is. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't well, know. Well, we're going to watch Karen. <laughs> the problem with that is that research. Gonna, yeah, but then it's going to get money. <laughs> see, yeah, I see your, your catch 22 there. It's, it's right. going to make money and they're going to be like, hey, this was good. And then and the people who are represented are like, no, no, no. It was just ridiculous and not our lives. <laughs> but that's why you saw it. Right. Yeah, I don't. It is so hard because you do want to, to you want to show the producers and show winners that our lives matter and that yeah. our stories matter, but there is like a fine line of, I It's think, almost so. like you can't win because even yeah. if, it's, if it's an amazing project yeah. with a diverse cast, there's always going to be some group who's going to get offended. Yeah. Right. Right. Like right. I had uh, flubbed up before and, <laughs> and mentioned Tyler Perry. There are so many... Tyler Perry movies out there that a lot of you know that are very some of the plot points of his movies are very controversial like a lot of um the community I guess I mean they say that he really relies on a lot of tropes that just are damaging yeah you know like the angry black woman trope mm -hmm. like he he leans on that a lot and um having seen just a few of his movies like he like I, I would say maybe three in my life he's got like a million but like yeah it, it is true I, I even like I'm white and I can even recognize that a lot of the stuff that he leans on is you know not it's, it's just like kind of crappy you know stereotypes and like I but like I said there are like a thousand Tyler Perry movies out there and you just have to wonder like is like is the trash like it gets made that's the thing it gets made and like clearly it's a formula and something that works but is that what we want out there are these the stories that we want to like be perpetuated and you know continuing to be out there or like or do we have to like sit like sit and wait for you know a get out or a you know sorry to bother you but you gotta wonder is this is yeah. this you know do we wait for the you know it almost seems like either we accept like a lot like a whole heap of garbage or we have to wait until we have the oscar movies which those alone have so so much <laughs> so so much baggage to them anyway yeah. Well, obviously, yeah, yeah. like we had Moonlight a couple years ago, um, which you know, everyone's like, oh, this has broken the formula. But again, it was it was kind of the black tragedy story, Brian, which you were touching on earlier. I mean, granted, you know, it was a fantastic film. The acting was just stellar. Um, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Well, what do you, are there examples out there where you guys think they did it right? This worked. This is you know, are there, are there any examples that you're like, yes. <laughs> and I think that speaks volumes in and of itself. The fact yeah, right. that we're having, it's like Genevieve, when we were doing the show about like the amazing, you know, amazing female characters in video games, it's like, oh, we have to think about it. It's not just <laughs> It's not like automatically like you can I can probably like 
on one hand I can like probably like shoot off like you know five off the top of my head but like it's it's difficult to get to the second hand and then it's almost impossible to like start counting toes you know mm-hmm. <laughs> like yeah, but the ones it, I can think of are Black Panther. ones that aren't even oh Black Panther is a good one um or like Minari or Parasite I enjoyed those yeah but, oh, because Parasite, they were interesting yeah. stories but also like they weren't they were made by international right directors right. So there wasn't like Hollywood was like, yes, yeah, it just gained traction here. Um, Antebellum, even though it was still de- dealing with, uh, I don't know, the slavery type. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there was one more. Oh, it'll come to me. <laughs> well, and then you you had the issue with um, which was the film that was uh, it was nominated for an Oscar for best foreign film, and they're like, this was made in America. Why is Minari? Minari, Minari. yeah, Minari. it's like why is this <laughs> in the Minari. foreign film you, category? You yeah. know the answer. I know. You know the answer. <laughs> we all know the answer. We all okay. know the answer because <laughs> it was the Golden Globes, right? It's the Hollywood Foreign Press, which oh. is well, we that's mm. a whole other. St- freaking episode right there the hollywood foreign press or... <laughs> oh you That's have only answer. white you people in here <laughs> i have been so far removed from the golden globes and the oscars it's because it's a joke it's like, a literally... joke thankfully yeah. it came to light this year and you know celebs it pulled comes out to light, like every year i know right every year like, something happens and you're like but there's Why? still no they're all white still yeah. okay yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's, it's just, it's really telling that we're, you know, we're struggling to come up with a solid example. And like, you know, for every, you know, Shonda, it's like the fact that Shonda Rhimes, you know, is as big as she is because she's the only one, you know, I'm I'm not saying she's not amazing. She's absolutely amazing, but it's like, you know, the same thing with Wonder Woman. It's like, we have a female director directing action film. It's like, but there's one, you know, (laughs) where for every, it's like everyone was, you know, the big discussion was like, well, if Wonder Woman flops, that's it for women starring in action films. And it's like, how many shitty action films have we had with men starring in them? Like, literally millions of dollars spent on some of the shittiest films out there and yet they keep getting made and no one should be allowed to fail we should yes. be yeah right yeah that was that's the thing is that they <laughs> it's like there is we a double standard it's like we're held to a higher one. standard yeah and you are now representative of your entire community and if you fail yeah your entire community fails. And it's like, well, white cis men have been failing for centuries. Centuries. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and where are they now on this panel? <laughs> right, right. It's like, we still have Sharknado. That's a thing that got made. Okay. <laughs> well, and it's doing and that- so well. <laughs> But also, like, we have another Fast and the Furious movie. Yeah. Nine. Just let it die. Just let it die. We have number nine. I love those movies. Okay. Okay. I want to pause Justin it. Justin Lin, this. I love you. I would be in a Fast I film. have yes. fun. I have a lot of fun watching the movies. And not because they're excellent, but because they're just silly. And I it's think it's fun. because yes. they're very soap opera-y. And yes. like, I think they're like the perfect mix of a soap opera and an action film uh, just put together because like, yes. you don't go into Fast and the Furious 9 expecting like, you know. No, no <laughs> so- you want to see crazy stunts with yeah. cars and, and, and it's just candy. It's yeah. just yes. candy that you That's see what I told people screen. about Mortal Kombat. Cause like, I'm a huge Mortal Kombat fan. <laughs> I still love the original, like that me movie got me for college. I oh my God. That movie. So when the second, you know, when the new one came out, I'm like, the reviews are coming in. I'm like, if you went into this expecting anything other than Mortal Kombat, like that's your problem. You know? right. like, that's what you, I thought. If you go in expecting <laughs> yeah. Mortal Kombat, you got Mortal Kombat. <laughs> Yeah, but my point, my point that I'm trying to make is, is that like Fast and the Furious, like 
<laughs> there will be more and like a thousand of them are going to be made like they'll they're going to be made until the end of time I feel like however it's like we know it's trash and we enjoy it so much so it's like other things like should just be given a chance too. like Agreed. you if you I, okay, so if you were given the script of Fast and the Furious 9 uh, to, like, actually pitch that, like, if you were giving somebody, like, your Fast and the Furious 9 script, but Fast and the Furious didn't exist, like, this was the first, like, entry into the Fast and the Furious, like, whatever, <laughs> what, what, like, they would read that and they'd be like, you are, you're, you're freaking crazy. Like, you are out, who are these characters? just be like, they, cars and explosions. Cars and explosions. <laughs> cars, explosions. Big Hollywood, like, production. But I think that's the problem with them is, like, I think Hollywood has, like, a lack of originality in just general. Like, all the stuff that's coming out now are either remakes or adaptations yeah. or sequels. Like, there's nothing, yeah. fair, like, there's some, but there's really like all the big Hollywood stuff is like things that they know is going to succeed and that they know that audiences are drawn to, but they're not interested in the stories, which they should be or what they were like in right. the past of like stories and what it means to be a creative or living in this world. Yeah. They're more interested in the money and the showmanship and the flashy stuff that they know will draw audiences in because it is like candy they just want to like you just want to yeah. forget everything and you're just like why should I deal with all this stuff give me the cars and like give me the diesel <laughs> and it'll be fine right <laughs> and at the core it's all about brotherhood it's about the family it's a family <laughs> that's what that that's what the fast movies are about is about brotherhood oh, family they and continue family. to tell us that and yet <laughs> somehow I feel a family is a is a distant second from cars and explosions well you know <laughs> the go, go, see it, go see it because Sen Kang his character yeah. on, I, uh, on Solo go see I, it. I would love to uh dive more into that because I I really believe that a lot of this is based on like hegemonic masculinity patriarchal society but that's a whole other is- like podcast <laughs> <laughs> It is true. That is true. It does. It does feed into that like horribly. Well, it's the same thing. Right. It's like, like you the know, Transformers I, movies are like. Oh God, yes. The Transformers <laughs> movies are like toxic masculinity, literally on wheels. Yeah. <laughs> why well, do I love them? Same. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, why, why do all your female characters have to be hot? Like, yeah. why can't we? Ha- and I feel like you know for the most part, the Brits do a much better job at this. You know, it's like, I tend to feel like they have more, at least with women, I feel like they're more representative of like actual women in the world. Whereas, you know, you've got Michelle Rodriguez in Fast and the Furious and it's like, you know, for every, and then, you know, it's like for every quote unquote ugly guy, it's like, you're never going to see, you know, what are the, what the examples with like all the sitcoms that were out for the longest time? It's like, you know, overweight, not so great looking ugly guy and his hot wife. Like that was the trope all through the nineties. And it's like, can we have a woman? Can <laughs> no. we have a woman who's over 50? You know, not, you know, it's interesting. Cause I feel like oh, sorry. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just sliding that one in there. <laughs> That's where she draws the line. <laughs> What were you saying, Diana? Uh, uh, I think movies are different than TV. Yeah. Um, yeah. With movies, you have to consider that there's money coming from other countries. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's making a lot of decisions in terms of casting. Right. Yes, it is. So, you know, there's a problem of sticking that one Chinese actor or actress in there just for a small couple lines because China is funding a lot of the film. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they it, have a very clear idea of what Hollywood looks like to them. Yeah. So they want mm-hmm. Tom Cruise. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, there's also the censorship issues, especially with the LGBTQ, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. community. Right. So mm-hmm. that's a whole other thing. That in the Marvel Disney films, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> where you'll get certain cuts. <laughs> that are absolutely <laughs> the u.s cut and the yeah mm-hmm. yeah uh, i forgot what it was um 
again, me and my podcast, I do a lot of driving. So I listen to a lot of podcasts. I forgot what, um, I forgot what book series it was, but it got, uh, a, a release in Russia there. It's a, it's an American author and it got a release in Russia and there was a not graphic, like there was, it, there, there's no like pornography in it, but there was a, um, uh, LGBTQ, um, uh, romance in it. And it was also, it wasn't the main characters either. Um, but unbeknownst to her, her agent, um, uh, her publicist rather cut that out of the Russian version. And then she only realized it when a fan from Russia who said that they read the, you know, the English version and then bought it uh, in the you know the Russian version saw that that was cut out that's how it was brought to her attention and she's like what <laughs> like nobody <laughs> told me that and so now she's um, basically blasting it all over Twitter and like it's a whole big thing because it's breach oh. of contract um, because they literally just changed her um, changed her story without her permission yeah. So now she's in a whole legal breach of contract thing. Um, wow. But crazy. yeah, you've got a lot of that going on. Uh, not the breach of contract thing, but a lot of the omitting stories for international audiences. Mm -hmm. And especially because of the country, like the governments and, you know, the politics that are running the countries, not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the citizens. It's yeah, different no, socio-political right. climates. Yeah. It's yeah. all the socio-political bullshit that you have to, you know, try and navigate. navigate. And I feel, I feel bad for, for them because I feel like the, their audiences are missing out yeah. on the stories yeah. because the government is not allowing that to be seen. Right, if we think we're missing out. Right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so with all that being said, obviously this is not something we can answer here in a matter of minutes, but like what needs to be done to push the needle forward, to, to get us closer to, like Brian said, representing what actual life is like, you know, on the, either the big screen or the small screen, you know? I'd say like, if you're an artist, just uh, start making your own shit and uh, yeah, keep creating and just just saturate the market with your <laughs> stories. That's what I think. The more that's out there, the better, because there there are people out here, even in LA, that that don't know about a certain community or whatever. And there's people in other states and other. I just think the more that's out there, the better. So just even if it's trash. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> just, <laughs> if it's fun trash. If it's fun trash. <laughs> it's fun, harmless <laughs> trash. I love fun, harmless trash. <laughs> I did like the first Transformers. Do you hate me? <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> horrible person. I loved it. <laughs> okay. It's, Thank you, Brian. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was, I was disappointed. I wanted more. Well, with every Transformers movie, for me personally, I want more Transformers and less humans. Mm -hmm. uh, I I would really not care if there was one human being in my Transformers. Movie. <laughs> so, that's where you go to the animated series. Yeah, that's where it falls short for me. Uh, the live actions is, is yeah. just like, don't need humans in my Transformers film. <laughs> right. It's much better. Especially if you can't write for humans <laughs> you can't write human dialogue don't do it <laughs> any other thoughts brian francesca i think people need to like speak out too you know act specifically coming from actors point of view like if you for example get a casting call that's like i need a spanish accent and that's not your wheelhouse then being able to say hey I can't do this but I know somebody else who can and just uplifting everyone in the community and everyone together because I think that even though actors are on the bottom of the totem pole we do have power we can say no and I think no is like one of the most powerful words you can say and just gently educating people whether it's casting or writers and 
at the same time, they had to be open to taking that criticism or whatever, but right. gently like educating and continuing the conversation and making sure it doesn't die out and doesn't become like the next phase or whatever. Um, I think we as an industry just have to be willing to to speak out about it more and mm -hmm. defend everyone who's in it and look out for each other. I mean, there was like yes. a discourse about like how when um, Stop Asian Hate was trending, how like Black Lives Matter just suddenly didn't matter anymore. Like it can, they, they coexist. We can, right. they are, everyone is facing their own problems and right. every majority uh, minority is facing their own difficult problems. We have to be open to that and realize that and work together because otherwise we're just going to divide each other and it's going to be it's going to be hard right so, uplifting people speaking out continuing to educate i think that's the best way <laughs> brian um this is a topic for me that i i think about quite a lot and i think like what am i gonna do how do I, like how what can i do to change things and i i think that as Diana said, you know, we have an obligation as artists to not only um, put that information out there, but also, like Francesca said, to raise our voice when we see that it's inaccurate. Um, I personally have been, and Lindsay and I have been kind of like sort of talking about working on a project together, because I really think that um, as and this is going to become a slightly esoteric conversation, but <laughs> I believe that as individuals, we have a, a three pronged uh, obligation of personal responsibility, empathy and objectivity. I think that a lot of that is missing in our world and individually, um, because if people, for instance, if a writer in a writer's room was more objective, they would say, okay, let's do some research and figure out how that person behaves. Let's go to these communities. Let's go talk to these people. Let's go, you know, um, do some literal research and information gathering that's near scientific that will give us the information to write these kind of stories authentically. Mm -hmm. um, empathy, I think that to be able to go to those communities and see what you have in common with them, um, and then uh, responsibility to to actually bring those voices and like Francesca was saying, to raise those voices with people who don't have them. Um, yeah. I really wish that there were a way we could work those three things into the education system from K through 12, right. but you know, that would be my answer. <laughs> In some ways this issue is like beyond even just the industry. <laughs> oh yeah, oh absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It feeds into everything. No, but. yeah. It's yeah. just that this industry is the most visual or, you know, yeah. it's people, people define their realities for better or for worse through entertainment, you know, uh, either they see themselves and what they're watching or they don't. And, you know, and to your points about, you know, stereotypes, it's like, well, if you've got a very insular community that has not experienced people from a wide range of cultures and the only examples they're seeing is what they're seeing in entertainment, then that is forming their perspective of that community in the world. And, you know, Brian, that goes to your point about like, well, changing up the education system. It's like, well, if this is all you've ever seen uh, this community represented and you don't know anything else, then that's how you're going to interpret it, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, that was, we could talk about this for a very long time. <laughs> very, very long time. We could have a multi-part series about all of this. Um, that's been a file that cannot be left <laughs> for days on end alone while we right. discuss. Right, I know. But um, thank you all both. I thank you all so much for joining us for this. Um, this has been an incredible conversation and you, you guys are just, just so inspirational and amazing. Um, before we wrap up, uh, let people know where they can find you, follow your work, or you know, reach out if they want. Uh, Francesca, um, I am on Twitter uh, at Monet at Work. Yeah, 
Monet at work. Sorry, I was, I was going to give you like my, my website. And then I was like, wait, uh, but my website is www.francesca-callo.com and all my social media is on there as well. Cool. Diana? Think I hear my, I hear my child. Uh, <laughs> Instagram, Diana Toshiko. I'm pretty sure that's it. It's my handle. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Brian? Uh, brianjpatterson.com is my website. All my social media is there. You can find out anything about me. Um, Brian J. Patterson is Instagram and BJP's tweets is Twitter. Yay. Um, and Genevieve, how can people find us? Well, <laughs> if you like what you saw here today and if you've seen any of our other shows, we would be very appreciative if you would like this video, subscribe to our channel and then ring that bell so that you get updates every time that we upload a video. We upload every Friday at noon Pacific Standard Time. Uh, we hope to see you guys again. We hope you enjoyed this show. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you guys. Thank you to our special guests. Um, I'm very excited um, to have you guys on. I'm very excited to see you again, Diana. Hi. <laughs> it's been a while. No COVID. It's too long. <laughs> awesome. Well, I guess we'll see you all next week. Yes.